Hello, welcome to Pathagonia. This is Jay. Sorry it's been such a long time since I last posted. I'm currently on my derm path rotation and it's been busier than expected. One of my goals is to make a lecture for my co-residents and I'll be making a derm path rise review. Um, prior slides uh, is thanks to Dr. Kelly Hall and Jamie Lombardo and I added my own slides. Those that I did add, I put the citations in the bottom of the slide. So without further ado, what underlying medical condition does this patient have? We have on our left erythematous skin that be is becoming ulcerated with developing eschars and on our right we have calcifications of the small vessels that, that involving the intima and media with some associated fat necrosis maybe some hemorrhage exactly this patient has end-stage renal disease the diagnosis is calciphylaxis which has a poor prognosis and thus important to differentiate it from Monkeberg's and we can order a von Casa to highlight the calcification. The histology of calciphylaxis, it involves the intima and media of the large and small blood vessels. It's associated with thrombi, as you can see in the top, and you can have hemorrhage within subcutaneous fat and fat necrosis. So Monkeberg sclerosis is calcifications of the media portion of the vessel, and it does not cause any luminal narrowing. Next case, you have a 32-year-old female with recent trauma to the finger. Imaging reveals a well-circumscribed mass in the subcutis, and grossly, it's well-circumscribed red multicystic mass. Histologically, we see a papillary structure within a vascular space. Uh, it's associated with areas of fibrin thrombi, and there's endothelial cells surrounding these structures, these minute structures, and there's no atypia nor mites. Exactly, this is intravascular papillary endothelial hyperplasia, aka Masson's tumor, and it's favored to be from recanalization of thrombus from hyperplastic endothelial proliferation. You look for papillary structures within vascular space. Here we see CD31 highlighting the endovascular endothelial cells. Next case, you have a slow-growing hard dermal nodule on the face of a kid. Histologically, we see this well-circumscribed mass. As we look closer, we can see a basaloid population of cells. We can see abrupt keratinization. And as we look closer to the wet keratin, we see cells of past, so kind of ghost cells. And we can see an inflammatory response with multinucleated giant cells. Yes, this is pyeloma trachoma, otherwise known as calcifying epithelioma of Malherb. It's an acquired hamartoma of hair follicle origin. And as mentioned before, you'll see a basal cell proliferation, abrupt keratinization, and wet keratin with ghost cells. Uh, the tumor keratin can elicit an inflammatory response, hence the giant cells. And it has a similar histology in a brain cellar tumor known as adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma. Next case, we have a symmetric, painful, erosive, crusted plaque on the intratriginous areas, such as in this case, the armpits. And histologically, we see extensive acantholysis with abundant eosinophilic cells without significant dyskeratosis nor hyperpigmentation like Grover's. Histologically, it does not extend down to the adnexa. And just for learning purposes, dyskeratosis the definition is abnormal keratinization occurring prematurely below the stratum granulosum. So what is the diagnosis and what, is, what are the DIF findings? So this is Haley-Haley disease. And the DIF finding is, is negative because this is the genetic condition. The autosomal dominant mutation in ATP2C1 leading to deficiency of desmoplegin and placoglobin. And you'll have this dilapidated brick wall appearance as you can see here. So in this other case, we see some flaccid bullae that have kind of like a fluid level. It's dependent on gravity. And if it pops, you have this macerated lesion. Histologically, you have this suprabasilar acantholysis. You have dyskeratosis that's not as prominent. And you have some tombstoning, meaning the hemidesmosomes attach, but not the desmosomes next to each other. What is the diagnosis and DIF pattern? Yes. So this is pemphigus vulgaris, and you'll have a net-like IgG pattern. And why there is tombstoning, you have antibodies to desmoglein-3, and desmoglein-3 makes up your part of your desmosomes, not your hemidesmosomes. That's why these desmosomes attaching one cell to another laterally will detach. And so you'll get that tombstoning where it'll still attach because you still got the hemidesmosomes. 
And this is a localization predilection for derriers, Haley Haley, and Grovers, which I find helpful to differentiate regardless of histology. Um, derriers is the most common sites are around the head and neck. Haley Haley is around the intertriginous areas. And Grovers is the chest and back. So your acantholytic dyskeratosis differentials include Grovers, which is also transient acantholytic dyskeratosis. It's not genetically acquired. And you'll have prominent dyskeratosis. You'll have your core vaunts and grains, some acantholysis with hypergranularity. Clinically, you have multiple small lesions, only span a few redi, and is acquired later in life. The classic patient is an older male. Derriere's disease, you'll have prominent dyskeratosis with your core vaunts and grains, some acantholysis with hypergranularity. It's a clinically a large greasy plaque on trunk and it's inherited defect in ATP2A2. So what are core rons and grains? I've always been confused. So I hope this clarifies things. Core rons are those cells with pycnotic nuclei. You can see that perinuclear clear halo right here um, and eosinophilic cytoplasm. And the grains are smaller cells. There's these compressed cells with elongated nuclei seen in the stratum, corneum, and granular layer. So this is Dr. Capon's little mnemonic for differentials of acantholytic dyskeratoses. And he has, it's a, like a love story. Grover's got a warty derriere and his girlfriend Haley has blisters. Together they live in a dilapidated brick house. So you have war Grover's warty dyskeratosis, which we didn't go over, uh, derri der derriere disease, and Haley Haley. Next case, we have an old person who has intense pruritus, and they have this tense bullae clinically on an erythematous base. And histologically, we see this subepidermal split with eosinophils. So what is the diagnosis and the DIF path? Yes. So this is pemphigus vulgaris, and you'll have a linear IgG and C3 at the basement membrane. So what clinical information do you want to know for these lesions? What is the diagnosis? Here you see these large junctional nests. It may have a little bit of shouldering. Um, it's in a young patient. It may have a little bit of pagetoid spread. Exactly. Location. Your special site nevi uh, include your scalp, ear, breast, genital, and acral skin. It's important to know because if you have atypia, you can have a higher threshold of calling it atypical melanocytic nevus. And how to distinguish this from melanoma? These special site nevi are well circumscribed. They have dermal maturation and they have a low dermal mitotic rate. So what is this? So we have a solitary, well circumscribed, symmetric dome-shaped, pinkish tan papule on a child. Histologically, we see vertical nests of epithelioid to spindled cells that are uniform. There may be a little bit of pagetoid scatter, and we have these uh, camino bodies, and there's a little bit of clefting here. Right, so these are spitz nevi. These are benign melanocytic neoplasms affecting children and young adults. These are the histologic findings, and you can get PAS positive eosinophilic hyaline globules called camino bodies, as you can see here. Here we have on our top right, irregular erythematous scaly ulcerations, and this entity you want to specify whether it's well differentiated, moderately differentiated, or poorly differentiated. Yes. So this is squamous cell carcinoma. And these cells have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, large often vesicular nucleus, variable keratinization. And it's important for us to mention on our sign outs, whether it's well diff, moderately diff, poorly diff, and whether there is any perineural invasion, and if it's greater than 0.1 or less than 0.1 millimeter. Next case, we have a 25-year-old female with a localized pink non-scaly annular plaque on the left anterior wrist. Histologically, we see granulomatous area with mucin without significant atypia. Uh, with, if we look closer, there will be histiocytes. Yes, this is granuloma annulare. Uh, it's a benign self-limited dermatoses with erythematous papules or plaques in an annular configuration. There are various inciting factors like viral infection, arthropod bite, UV, HIV, medications. And there are two classic morphologic patterns. Personally, number one is easier for me to recognize. You'll have this palisaded granuloma with central necrobiosis, which is an actual necrosis, but it's just degradation of the collagen and it looks necrotic. And you'll have this peripheral histiocytes and admixed lymphocytes. And then number two is a little bit harder. Um, you'll have histiocytes intercalating among collagen bundles with interstitial mucin and you can get a CD68 to 
highlight the histiocytes in the hale colloidal iron and ashium blue. So the next case, you'll have a you have a clinical nodule on the extremity of a young person. It's a globular lobulated swelling in the proximal phalanx of the right ring finger with some num numbness. And here, histologically, we see kind of a granulomatous looking architecture with hemorrhage. And then as we look closer, in reference to our red blood cell size, these cells are very enlarged and atypical. Um, there's some pleomorphism. Uh, there's some scattered mitotic figures as well. So and it's EMA positive, and it's a tumor of uncertain differentiation. This is epithelioid sarcoma. And what are the metastasis locations and molecular findings? So this tends to go to the lymph nodes, uh, can go to the lungs, the scalp, and molecular findings is an INI smart B1 loss. And it's a mass in the subcutaneous to fascial-based soft tissue sites of distal extremities of young adults. Uh, cases are often missed and excised with diagnosis of reactive conditions like granuloma annulare, but will reoccur. And in fact, you can get metastasis in 45% of cases, usually to lungs, other skin sites, uh, including the scalp and lymph nodes. And molecularly, you'll have an INI smart B1 loss. Of note, other entities associated with an INI smart B1 loss include renal medullary carcinoma, malignant rhabdoid tumor of the kidney and soft tissue, and atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor in your uh, midline tumors of the CNS. Uh, it's a poor prognosis. The death from disease is 31%. And again, your differential is granuloma annulare. You can get a keratin, and granuloma annulare is keratin negative. Next case, we have a tongue nodule. And here, histologically, we see pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. We see spiker, spiky squamous nests, but if you look closer, there's no atypia, there's no mitotic figure, and as you can see, the dermis is busy with these cells. So what's the diagnosis? Yes, this is pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, and this is granular cell tumor in the oral cavity. You'll have these cells with granular cytoplasm, and they'll have eosinophilic PAS positive round droplets, and these are lysosomes. And it's associated with pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, and the IHC is S100 CD68 positive. And those granules that you see here, these are called the pustulo ovoid bodies of Millian, and they're lysosomes. Next case, we have a skin biopsy, and we see lymphocytic infiltration of the superficial and deep perivascular and periadnexal structures. And as we look closer to the epidermis, we see these dead reds. These are dyskeratinocytes. And this, associate, this lets us know this is an um, interface dermatitis. More specifically, um, if it's lichenoid or vacuolar, we can see these vacuolar spaces. So this is a vacuolar um, interface with perivascular and periadnexal, both superficial and deep. So what's the diagnosis? Yes, this is lupus. How about this? So here we have a targetoid lesion. Uh, there's central dusky area followed surrounded by lighter edematous regions with peripheral erythematous margin. Histologically, we see this normal, normal stratum corneum, but quote unquote death and squalor underneath with necrosis and inflammatory infiltrates here with a paucity of neutrophil. What's the diagnosis and what's the viral, viral association? Yes, this is erythema multiforme. In erythema multiforme, it's associated with HSV infection in a distant location. And you can also get a vacuolar interface pattern like you do in lupus. And you can see the dead res and you can see the vacuolar pattern. It's important to know that even though lupus and erythema multiforme both can have vacuolar interface pattern, um, you have to know the difference. So erythema multiforme is an acute hypersensitivity reaction to drugs and bugs. Uh, it makes a target lesion um, you'll have a subepidermal bullet with the basement membrane in the roof of the bullet due to the significant edema. And or uh, DIF patterns, you'll have granular C3 and IgM in the basement membrane. And in lupus, you'll have a lot of interstitial mucin, um, that superficial deep perivascular, periannexal, lymphocytic chronic infil infiltrate with plus or minus a vacuolar interface pattern. So here, what is the diagnosis and what is the IHC? Yes, this is DFSP, and it's CD34 positive, a factor 13A negative. So this is non-circumscribed, has storiform pattern, uh, it has honeycomb fat trapping, and it does not respect the adnexal structures. Uh, CD34 positive, factor 13A negative, and 
Translocation is 1722, COL1A1, PDGFB, and important to know that 10% can undergo fibrosarcomatous transformation. Here we see these buckshot scattered cells in the epidermis and that go all the way pretty up to the stratum granulosum. So what are the differential diagnosis? So this is pagetoid things and your differential is BMS in the PM, Bowen's or squamous cell carcinoma in situ, melanoma, sebaceous carcinoma, Paget's disease, and Merkel cell carcinoma. So Paget's, I like to break it, it's, we break it down as, is it mammary in the breast or extra mammary? If it's in the breast, it's, uh, there is an underlying DCIS or invasive ductal, and your IHC, you can get a GATA3, CK7, GCD, FP15, or HER2. An extra mammary <clears throat> that's not in the breast, you wanna think, is this primary or secondary? Now, what is the difference? So primary extra mammary pageants, it's thought to come from the skin itself, from cancerous apocrine glands. Thus, there is no underlying tumor outside of the epidermis. So in, if it's in the vulvar skin, you can get a GCDFP15, CEA, EMA. Now, secondary extra mammary pages, there is an underlying cancer, not of the skin. You can have an underlying carcinoma, the GU, gyne, colorectal, and the IC is same as the underlying carcinoma, often CK20 positive, which is helpful. Melanoma staging. So the thing that's been tested a lot is the 0.8 millimeter thickness. The reason why it's so important is if it's greater than 0.8 millimeters, then that's when you'll do your sentinel lymph node biopsy, um, which is more invasive to the patient. And then the two things that affect staging for melanomas are your breast load depth, as well as your um, whether you have ulceration or no ulcer. So the biggest ones that's always been tested is this 0.8 which represents T1 and four millimeters, which represents T4. Here we have a well-circumscribed dermal lesion. It has a maze-like architecture with no, if we look closer, there is no cellular atypia. You'll have cuboidal columnar cells with myoepithelial cells. So what is a diagnosis and what is a typical location? Right, this is hydroadenoma papillifera, and it's commonly seen in the vulva. Here we see a pink hairless nodule on the scalp. Histologically, we see an exoendophytic proliferation of glands with papillary architecture contiguous with the epidermis. So what's the diagnosis? So this is syringocystadenoma papillifera. Remember the S for it's sliding into the dermis, so it's contiguous with the dermis and it's on the scalp whereas hydroadenoma papilliferum hides in the vulva. Here we see a stuck-on, greasy-like, cerebriform-like nodules in a linear arrangement along Blaschko's lines. So what are Blaschko's lines? These are lines on the skin that is a, the, the developmental growth pattern during epidermal cell migration. And his, histologically, we see kind of these pseudo horns, kind of a flattened reedy ridge, wheat-like stratum corneum. So this is an epidermal nevus. It looks like a several keratosis, but it's on a kid. Next case, we have a hairless plaque and it's smooth to a verruciform and it's present at birth. And histologically, we see the abundant sebaceous glands opening into the epidermis. So what's the diagnosis? Yes, so this is nevus sebaceous. It's a subtype of epidermal nevus. So what is the pattern that we see and what are some of the differential diagnoses? So we can see the desmosomes kind of really spaced apart from each other. There's a lot of fluid buildup. And so this is spongiosis. And your differential depends on whether there are EOs or no EOs. With EOs, you have allergic contact dermatitis, numular dermatitis, which clinically looks like a coin-shaped lesion, atopic dermatitis, arthropod bite, drug eruption, dermatophytosis. And without EOs, you can have contact dermatitis, numular dermatitis. You can see that they overlap as well as dermatophytosis. So here we see these, what is this called? What is the diagnosis? What is the other name for this diagnosis? This is varicae bodies. This is seen in the cellular region of a schwannoma, Antony A. And the other name is neurolamoma. So what is the diagnosis here? And what's the classic location? Here we see a little bit, bit of uh, hyperkeratosis. We see a little bit of homogenization of the papillary dermis. We see lymphocytes. Yes, this is lichen sclerosis. This is in the vulva, although it can be extragenital though. And lichen sclerosis, remember, is a risk factor for 
DVIN and HPV-independent squamous cell carcinoma, which has worse prognosis than HPV-driven squamous cell carcinoma. Here's another schematic where you have that classic red, white, and blue hyperkeratosis, homogenized and hyalinized papillary dermis, and this blue lymphocytic infiltrate. This next case, uh, what's the diagnosis? In this next case, we see mature adipocytes, bland spindle cells here, and we see some hyalinized rope-like collagen set against a mixed weight background. So what's the diagnosis? What stains can you do to confirm it? And what's the location? Yes. This is a spindle cell lipoma. You can get a CD34 and it's in a back in a cape-like distribution. And this is associated with somatic mutation in retinal blastoma 1 gene. Uh, what are some other entities? So here are some other entities. The ones I've been taught classically is the cellular angiofibroma, myofibroblastoma. But as you can see here, it's a growing entity. And so it's for your reference, but at least know this cellular angiofibroma and myofibroblastoma. So here we see basaloid cells with salt and pepper chromatin. There's nuclear molding, kind of looks powdery, not on this section, but you, will ha you can have abundant mites and necrosis. So what's the diagnosis? What's the classic staining pattern? What's the viral association? Yes, this is Merkel cell carcinoma. Classic staining patterns include your neuroendocrine markers. You can get a CD56, synapto, chromo, INSM1. Your cytokeratins will also be positive. And the viral association is polyoma. And here is your CK20 perinuclear dot light. Practical tip, when you see a basal cell carcinoma, which you will see a lot of on your derm path rotation, make sure to always rule out a Merkel cell. Basal cell, you'll have budding from the epidermis, whereas Merkel cell will kind of be predominantly dermal. Uh, you'll have peripheral plat palisading, mixoid stroma, and stromal retraction. Here we have action is in the dermis where we see a lot of proliferation of vessels, a little bit fibrotic, um, proliferation of these kind of fibroblasts. So what's the diagnosis and what's the syndrome association, especially if it's like around the nose? Yes, this is angiofibroma and it's associated with tuberous sclerosis. Um, they have this misnomer if, if it is associated with tuberous sclerosis, they call it adenoma sebaceum. It's not a proliferation of sebaceous glands, but it's thought they called it because it kind of proliferates around areas where there's a lot of sebaceous glands. Tuberous sclerosis, TSE1, TSE2, so it goes in order, a chromosome 9, 16, a Hamerton, tuberin. So these are some of the findings for CNS. You can get SEGAs and subependymal nodules. They're basically the same thing, but just there's a size difference, whether it's greater than one or less than one centimeter. Kidneys, you can get your angiomyolipomas. Lungs, you can get your lymphangiomyomatosis. And heart, you can have your rhabdomyomas um, and where you can get spider cells. Here, we see this pearly lesion with vessel telangiectasias and fibromyxoid stroma. You can see a little bit of palisading, some stromal clefting, some mites, and some apoptotic bodies. So what's the diagnosis? What's the syndrome association? Yes, so this is basal cell carcinoma. It's associated with Gorlin's or basal cell nevus syndrome. It's due to a patch one tumor suppressor gene mutation on chromosome nine. Uh, this is Dr. Capen's helpful mnemonic. Gorlin syndrome, it's on chromosome nine because you're on the ninth inning. You have this hat with two lines because you can get bilamellar calcifications of the false cerebi. Uh, you can get an OKC or odontokeratinogenic cyst. Um, it's patch one. You get this on base. You have this basal cell carcinoma. You have the Palmer pits and MLB for medulloblastoma. Here we have this smooth dome-shaped appearance on the face. From low power, you see the squamal proliferative lesion in a rounded lobular architecture. There's hyperkeratosis, and as you look closer, there's these clear cells that are palisading, and you have this thickened basement membrane. What's the diagnosis? What's the syndrome association? Yes, this is tricholoma or tricholoma because it's associated with caudin. Tricholoma's ar arise from the outer root sheath, and that explains why they kind of look clear. And this is due to a mutation in P10 on chromosome 10, and you have an increased risk for thyroid cancer, and I thought this was a good mnemonic for Caldens. So you have thyroid cancer, breast cancer, uterine cancer, macrocephaly, and you can get multiple hamartomas. So here you have a 50-year-old with skin lesion and lung lesion. So they do a lung FNA, and you see this kind of cell, this uh, bug-eyed demon. So this is metastatic melanoma. Name this viral virus viral inclusion that you see here. 
So this is molluscum contagiosum and the viral inclusions are Henderson-Patterson bodies. So here, these are all HPV driven. Here we have this hypergranular area and the, the cytoplasm quality is gunmetal gray. And this could be found incidentally, or if you have a uh, genetic condition that, pre, that lets you unable to fight HPV infections, it can be found all throughout your body. So this is epidermal dysplasia verusiformis or EDV. Here we see what looks, it looks like an ant's going up an ant hill. Uh, sorry, I can't give you the entire photo, but this is a uh, mermesial wart and it's common on the hands and feet. Here you have this exophytic papillomatous compact eosinophilic hyperkeratosis. You have these vertical tears with blood um, and then in the dells you have hypergranulosis. So this is Veruca vulgaris and here you have, this is on the genital skin, gentle, relatively gentle contouring that kind of looks like neck, knuckles. You have a little bit of compact stratum corneum, uh, coarse hypergranules, and uh, the perikeratosis, the cells will look round, and you get a little bit of uh, cholecytic change. So this is condyloma acuminolatum. So name this viral virus inclusion and the findings. Yep, this is HSV molding margination multinucleation. Here you have this vascular tumor with a lot of red blood cells, and you have this vessel. It's a small vessel growing inside a vessel. So this is HHV8 uh, Kaposi sarcoma, and this is called the promontory sign. So this is a hand of a farmer who tends to goat and sheep, and you have these cytoplasmic inclusions. So this is ORF, or ecthyma contagiosum, and it's a parapox virus of sheep and goats. And then S100 is not just for melanocytes, it also stains Schwann cells. That's why schwannomas are diffusely S100 positive. Also for nerve sheath tumors, myoepithelial cells, adipocytes, Langerhans cells, dendritic cells. High risk types are 16, 18, associated with H cell and L cell uh, low risk is 611. And this is surgical pathology billing and skin. I put the source of the Medicare RVU for the 2023 for the price for each code. So 88305 is $71. Cis tax lipomas are 88304, so that's $43. Uh, special stains are 88312. Special stains not for organisms uh, are 88313. Uh, decal is 88311. And your first IHC is 88342, followed by your second one. Ad additional ones are 88341. Good luck to us on the rise. Acknowledgements. Thank you to the DermPath staff for the amazing teaching. So thank you.